Turn to someone and say Shabbat Shalom. This is a nice little picture that I took on the Sea of Galilee one year on one of our tours. I, I love these little sailboats that were out there, wishing I could be there. But here we are, Balak, and do you know his name is the Terminator, the son of Little Bird. <laughs> I, uh, I always thought that's so funny. You sound so tough. Now Balak, the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Now, the Amorites were Canaanites, all right? And God wanted to end up getting rid of all the Canaanites. And look what it says in verse 3 and 5. Moab was how afraid? I mean, it's one thing to be afraid. It's another thing to be exceedingly afraid. But why should Moab have been afraid when God specifically told Moses and the Israeli people they were to leave him alone? They were to leave alone the Moabites, the Ammonites, because they were sons of Lot. Okay, the Midianites, because they were sons of Abraham and Keturah. And so how often do we see people acting irrationally in fear? Look at the Middle East situation. It's like all these people are afraid of Israel. Israel wasn't going to attack them. They, they want to be defensive. They're not going to go around trying to conquer other nations. And yet we find the same process is working today where people are afraid, but it's in their mind. It's mental. It's not reality. And it says they were exceedingly afraid because there was a whole bunch of them. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And then it says Moab was what? Sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So what does Moab do? They go to the Midianites and speak to their leaders. And they say, this company is going to lick up everything around us like an ox licks up the grass of the field. I can't help but think of those old stories of the buffaloes, you know, or the movies of where the buffaloes have gone through, and it's just like a barren land, nothing there. And that's kind of what they're thinking. And so Balak, the son of Zippor, he was the king of the Moabites at that time. And so he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, Pothor, which, uh, Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people. And look, to call him, and look what they're saying. Look, there's a people who have come from Egypt. It's like they don't even know it's their relatives. They just, they don't have any clue who these people are. See, it says they cover the face of the earth, and they're moving next door. I mean, how many of us know they didn't cover the face of the whole earth? All right. And the Moabites and the Midianites are relatives, and yet you have these relatives who are working against them. Now look at verse 6. Look what Balak says to Balaam. Therefore, please come at once and curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I'll be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. And then look what he says concerning Balaam. He says, I know he whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. If that is the case, if he really believed that, why didn't he ask Balaam just to come and bless him? <laughs> why, why is he focused on cursing them rather than, why don't you come and bless me for protection? It's an attitude of destruction. I'm not happy until you're gone. It's like I can't be happy unless you're gone. There's no way we can both occupy Look at the Palestinian situation. They don't want a two-state solution, even though that's what they're calling for. They really want no Israel. This is the same thing playing out. Now, tell me this. Where did the Moabites and the Ammonites come from? Lot. Don't you think Lot was with Abraham in Genesis 12, when God said, whoever is blessed will be you blessed, and whoever is cursed, you, you will be cursed. Lot was there with him. So don't you think Lot would have told his kids? There's something about that I'm going to share here in a little bit. 
Numbers 22, 7 through 12. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian, they depart with the fees for divination in their hand. Here is a prophet for hire. Isn't that interesting? So here they're going to go. They have to pay this prophet for money, uh, for the prophecy. And so it says they came to Balaam and they gave him Balak's message. So we see Balak wasn't with him. And so what does Balaam do? He says, okay, why don't you guys spend the night and I'll bring back a word to you as the Lord speaks to me. And so what happens? The princes of Midian of Moab stay with Balaam. And look, it does say it's the God of Israel who comes to Balaam. Now, he says, who are these men with you? Do you really think he didn't know who they were? <laughs> it's like when the police interrogate someone. They ask him questions they already know the answer to. And so here God just says, well, you know, what's going on here? Who are these people? And Balaam, look what he says to God. Well, it's Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. It covers the face of the earth. Now come and curse them for me. Perhaps I'll be able to fight against them and drive them out. And look what God says to Balaam. You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Okay? He's not to go with them. He's not to curse the people, for they're blessed. So what does Balaam do the following morning? In verse 13, he got up in the morning and he said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your own land. The Lord has refused to let me go with you. Okay. There's a big problem here. Balaam did not tell them exactly what God said. He did not say the whole truth, nothing but the truth. He gave part of the truth. Only half of what God said. And also injected his own interpretation to what God said. He rephrased it. Listen to what he says, and I'm going to say it in a different way, the same words, but you will hear it differently. The Lord has refused to let me go with you. Notice the prince's response to Balak when they go back they say Balaam refuses to come with us. In other words, they're thinking we're not good enough for Balaam to come with. Okay, so God said, you know, I can't go with you. So do you see how all of a sudden it's misinterpreted because how he said it? All right. Now, Balaam desperately wants to go. But he also knows he's not supposed to go against God. And he's softening the situation, hoping that God's mind might be changed under the right circumstances. And so what happens in Numbers 22, 14, the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. So once again, Balak sends princes more in number, more honorable than the other ones. And they came to Balaam and said, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor, and whatever you say to me, I will do. Then again, come and curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the commandment of the Lord my God to do less or more. So you too, why don't you spend the night? And let me find out what God says. And so God came to Balaam at night and said to Balaam, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. And then it says in Numbers 22, 1, Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But then it says in verse 22, God's anger, God's anger was kindled because he went. Now, wait a minute. How come God said you can go with them, and now God's mad because he went with them? The problem is English. I don't know what it is in Russian 
or in Spanish, but let me tell you what the Hebrew actually says. The first time God came to Balaam at night and said to him, if the man have come to call you, so first off, the men have to come and call on him. He can't just get up and go running to them. And then he says, rise and go with them, but only do what I tell you. There's two different Hebrew words. One is im ahem, which means don't go with them in common purpose. Yet the word etam means with them, but not embracing their purpose. So God said, you can accompany them, but you cannot go with your heart purpose to curse. So he not only accompanied them, which was okay in his heart, he went along so he could curse. You following me? How many of you know, I'll give you a true story. How many of you ever heard of Cops, that movie Cops? My son was actually one of the scenarios, okay? I, my other son, that many of you don't know, Andrew, he was like in Virginia or something like that. Uh, and he had, uh, something had happened and he was needing a ride and a lady in a pickup truck comes by and picks him up as he is, you know, looking for a ride. Unbeknownst to him, she had just robbed a gas station. And she was going down the street. And the next thing my son knows, the cops are going after her. And then they stop her. And they ask my son, you know, are you with her? Well, I'm with her, but I'm not with her. <laughs> Do you understand the difference now? Okay. Uh, so, Anyway, this is the thing with going on here. He said you can go with them, accompany them, but you can't go with them with the same heart to curse. So that's the problem with with in the English. Okay, so then what happens? We have the story of the donkey. I'll use the word dumb donkey. And that's my tour portion. The dumb donkey is allowed to speak. Okay, here we go. He was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. And then Numbers 22, 23 through 28. Here Balaam is supposed to be this great prophet who can see. But the ass is the one who saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And so the ass turns the side out of the way and goes into a field. And so Balaam smites this donkey to turn her back into the way he wants to go. But the angel of the Lord is standing in the path of the vineyards, a wall on one side, a wall on the other side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord again, she thrust herself into the wall. And what did she do? She crushed Balaam's foot. That is a big hint by God to Balaam, your walk is not right. And then he smites the donkey again. And then the angel of the Lord goes further and he stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right or to the left. And this time again, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. She just falls under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smites this poor donkey again with his staff. And now the Lord opens the mouth of the donkey and says to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have smitten me these three times? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like how often do donkeys talk? Uh, but Balaam is having a conversation with the donkey. And Balaam said to the donkey, because you've mocked me. Here's someone who's full of pride. And how many of you know people that are full of pride sometimes will go down a way that they're determined to go and nothing's going to stop them and all you can do is get out of the way. He says, that, I wish there was a sword in my hand for I would kill you. And then the Lord opens Balaam's eyes and now he sees the angel with the sword drawn in his hand. And now he falls down <laughs> Oh, uh, and falls flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord says to him, now tell me again, why have you smitten your donkey these three times? <laughs> he goes, behold, I went out to withstand you because your way is perverse. And the donkey saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless you had turned from me, surely now I also would have killed you and saved her alive. Whenever someone has an ulterior motive, it could be money, it could be power, it could be a person can literally become completely blind. How do you know someone who gets so angry 
are go they're so f full bent on going a certain direction they they have no focus on the bigger picture they don't know what's going on that happens god can usually uh, spell it out to the person but they won't see it cuz they're too focused that's what's frightening it can be clear as day to an objective observer, but the person on his way, you know, is like a sheep to the slaughter. They can't see what's in front of their own eyes. But guess who Balak, the king of Moab's grandson, was Eglon. Any of you remember Eglon and the story of Eglon? What's amazing is Ruth was the daughter of Eglon. The Moabite, Ruth the Moabite. Can you imagine? All right. Now, what's fascinating about that, just as Balak tries to curse the Israelite people three times with the aid of Balaam, we see Ruth being told three times to go back to Moab by Naomi. The exact same three times. In Ruth 1.11, Naomi says, turn back my daughters. In Ruth 1.12, turn back my daughters. Go your way. 1.15, she says, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. So three times, R Ruth is to go back. I think that's quite fascinating. Okay, so what happens? Numbers 23.13, Balak said to him come I pray you with me to another place in other words if you can't curse him from here let's go to another place where you can see him and you will see but the uttermost part of them and shall not see them all but curse me them from there I tell you what if God says you can't curse him I don't care where on this planet you're going to try to curse him it's not going to happen so in verse 27 Balak says to Balaam uh, you know come I pray you I will bring you to another place for adventure. It will please God that you may curse, uh, curse me them from there. I think it's quite interesting. He says that you may curse me them. He got to curse me. But here's the thing. Blaming others or changing locations never works. If you remember in Genesis 18, Abraham never left. He stayed in one place. Uh, Numbers 22, 6. Therefore, he says, please come at once and curse this people for me. I've, why didn't he say bless me? Instead, it's just a bad attitude. Now, here's something interesting. Look at Numbers 24, verse 8 and 9. It says, God brought him forth out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He'll eat up the nations, his enemies. He'll break their bones. He'll pierce them through with his arrows. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who will stir him up? Blessed is he that blesses you, and cursed is he that curses you. Wow, this sounds exactly like what was said to Abraham, doesn't it? But do you know what? Even though in English it's the same word curse, th there's two different Hebrew implications. What it really is saying, whoever temporarily speaks lightly of you will forever be cursed. Wow, isn't that amazing? Whoever speaks lightly of the nation of Israel, even though this life is temporary, will be cursed forever. Isn't that right? That's what uh, Rabbi Shapiro and I were talking about at the computer here just a little bit ago. Okay, so what do we see? Uh, let's go down to Numbers 24. Let me see what time it is. Okay, 10 through 14. So now Balak is full of wrath against Balaam. You know what's so interesting? Almost all the times in these wars against Israel, all the nations come together against Israel, and they always end up attacking each other. Go figure. And so he's angrily waving his hands. I can just see him. And he said to Balaam, I sent for you so that those who are against me might be cursed. But now look, three times you've given them a blessing. Just get the heck out of here. Go back. He says, it was my purpose to give you a place of honor, but now the Lord has kept you back from honor. So Balaam says to Balak, well, didn't I tell you the men that sent me, even if Balak gave me his house full of silver and gold, it wouldn't be possible for me to go outside the orders of the Lord, doing good or evil at the impulse of my mind. Whatever the Lord says, I will say. So now he says, okay, fine, I'll go back to my people. But first, let me make clear to you what this people are going to you do to your people in the days to come. Wow. 
So what do we see happens in Numbers 25, 5 through 7? So Moses says to the judges of Israel, let everyone be put to death, those of his men who have had relationships with the women of Moab in honor of the Baal of Peor. But Balaam said, is, look, God is not going to curse them. So the only thing you can do, I give you counsel, Balak, what you need to do is make them go against God's will and God will take care of it. And look what's happening in America day, to date. I believe that America has been a blessed nation, but we've turned our back on God until the protective barrier has been taken down. Now, I don't know how many of you know this. Did you know? July 4th, 1776. Who's ever heard of July 4th, 1776? That was the 17th of Tammuz that year. Jul our very Independence Day was founded on the 17th of Tammuz, the worship of the golden calf. And I see that big calf on Wall Street, the big bull. And I'm telling you, it is not a good sign. Okay, so look what happens. One of the children of Israel come to his brothers, taking with them a woman of Midian, right before the eyes of Moses and all the meeting of the people while they were weeping at the door of the tent of meeting. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, got up from among the people and took a spear in his hand. That's next week's Torah portion. On Phinehas. And who does he kill? The prince of Israel and this Midianite girl. Do you know what's amazing about this is, let me just check something uh, here. Uh, yeah. Wow. He kills this Midianite lady. Moses is married to a Midianite. Do you remember that? Do you know Phineas's mom is a Midianite? And yet, look what happens. We'll talk about that more next week. Well, so let's fast forward several centuries later during the time of Elisha. In 2 Kings 3, 26 and 27, the king of Moab saw the battle was too sore for him. And so he took 700 men that drew swords to break through the, to the king of Edom. But they couldn't do that. So look what the king of Moab did. He took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead, and he offered his own son for a burnt offering. Now, if you remember, the Moabites served Molech, and they would always take their firstborn and offer it to Molech. Well, evidently, that didn't happen when he was a kid. And here he is offering his own son on the wall. And now, how many of you would, what would you think if the king of Moab sacrifices his own son and kills them? Do you think people would be upset at him for doing that? But no, look what happens. There was great indignation against Israel. Why would there be great indignation against Israel when the king of Moab killed his eldest son? Well, because Israel, if they hadn't have defended themselves, that wouldn't have happened. What do we see going on today with the Palestinians? They're killing all of their own children, and people are blaming Israel. It's the same thing that's going on today, and there's great indignation toward Israel. This is craziness. And then I'll close with a, a hop Torah. Just due to time, I'll go a little faster. Micah chapter 3, 9 through 11, it says, Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob, rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice. Can you imagine that? Look what's happening today. They detest justice. They make crooked all that is straight. Who build Zion with blood, Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. The prophets practice divination for money. That's like Balaam. And yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Do today's religious leaders often love gain rather than truth? 
Is this what we see in the prosperity gospel and the seeker-sensitive movements and the like? All for the sake of outward growth rather than looking for true repentance from the heart. This is what, you know, I just read something the other day. I think 40% of pastors don't believe the Bible is the word of God, and these are the pastors. This is where we're at. In Micah 5, 10 through 15, it will happen in that day, says the Lord, that. Now, look at this. These are, you heard of the I wills of Satan in Ezekiel. Well, here's the I wills of God in Micah. Verse 10, I will cut off your horses out of your midst. I'll destroy, I will destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land. I will tear them down, all your strongholds. I will destroy witchcraft from your hand, and you'll have no soothsayers. I will cut off your engraved images and your pillars out of your midst, and you'll no more worship the works of your hands. That's always a big problem with our wonderful works. We want God to love the wonderful works of our hands that we have made. We're going to talk about that more next week. Next week, we're going to start the book of Ephesians for the second half. And then uh, number 14, I'm going to uproot your Asherim out of your midst. I'll destroy your cities. I will execute vengeance and anger and wrath on the nations that don't listen. Wow. And so... Micah 6, 1 through 5, it says, Hear now what the Lord says, Arise, and you plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint. You strong foundations of the earth. The Lord has a complaint against who? His people. The big complaint of God isn't against the heathen. The big complaint of God has always been with his own kids. And he's going to contend with Israel. And he says, oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. Who's going to stand a chance in the God's court to testify against him saying, here's why I didn't serve you. God says, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled. And what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. Okay, wow. Micah 6, 6 through 7. Look what the, this is the, you have to understand who's talking here. This is the bad people talking. Well, how shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come with burnt offerings, calves a year old? Is the Lord going to be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Am I supposed to give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? That is the bad people. But what does Micah respond? He says, it doesn't say he has told you. It says he has showed you what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Wow. I don't have to do that. I'm not under the law. (laughs) Was God ever a burden to Israel? He was not a burden. God was pleading his case here. He delivered them. He redeemed them. He provided them with leadership. He adopted them. He blessed them. Uh, So anyway, with that said, We need to understand how much God loves us. How often do people curse God because they think he did them bad? All God said, paraphrase, don't stick your hand in the blender when it's running. (laughs) And then we stick our hand in the blender when it's running and get mad at God. (laughs) Come on. Okay, so let's stand and pray. And then we're going to take like a 20-minute break. Then we'll come back. We'll have uh, live worship from our live worship team. Uh, And then we're going to have a Rabbi Shapira special. Yay! Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand what you're saying to us in these last of the last of the last days. God, we don't want to have the eyes to see of... uh, Balaam when it's too late we want to have the eyes of the donkey (laughs) and we want to see what's going on so God 
don't let us be our mind so focused on cursing and hatred that we can't see what's happening right before us. And Father, I thank you for all of those around the world, around the United States, and those here locally who want to bring your light of the Torah into the darkness of this world. We thank you for it, for all those who uh, help finance this great movement of yours. It's not ours, it's yours. We just want to be a participant. We don't want to watch what happened. We don't want to wonder what happened. We want to make things happen with you and for your kingdom and let it all be for your glory. And we want to work with what you give us, not the work of our own hands. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. All right. At this time, drumroll, we have Rabbi Shapiro. <laughs> We're so grateful. Uh, here's a bottle of water. If Thank you, you want one, I'll put it here. To have Rabbi Shapiro with us today. He and I have been uh, basically tied at the hip for I don't know how many years. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> a decade, a long time. But I want everyone to know how much I really appreciate this man. Uh, I believe he is one of, uh, I don't know if I want to use this word, uh, apostle or shaliyach. Uh, but he is one who is really someone who is at the forefront. He's at the tip of the spear in accomplishing what God wants done at this time. He's not one who's doing this because he wanted to do it. I believe he's doing it because God sent him on a mission. And I just really appreciate him. Uh, he is like, I don't want to say one of the few. Uh, he's like the only one <laughs> that I believe that is really truly representing the good news to the Jewish people. And you can see the fruit. You can see the results. And I just appreciate uh, everything that he knows, his friendship, everything that he's done, all that we work together, which is why we always support him financially. And I encourage everyone live streaming around the world also to support what he's doing uh, because he's not doing a earthly work. He's doing an eternal work. Amen. These are things that are being done in the uh, heavens or being echoed here on earth. And, and I really believe that he is the one at the forefront seeing all of this get done. Let's give Rabbi Shapiro a big hand. Thank you so much. I want to uh, take uh, this precious time today and, and to testify, to give a real testimony. I know that uh, we're speaking a lot about taking the Torah to the world, taking the Torah to the nation, reconciling Christianity and Judaism. What I wanted to do today, because honestly, I, I was not scheduled to come to Washington. It was way out of the way. It was our uh, trip, and it's very rare because I'm going to be, for the next eight weeks, if you can keep me in prayer, I'm going to be in Africa, South Korea, France, and back to the Caribbeans. And so we need a lot of prayers for the, the traveling mercies. But I uh, was so convicted by the Lord from this last trip, and I had the privilege of inviting uh, Pastor Mark uh, to join in us, and I was so glad that he said, yes, I'll come to the Dominican Republic. I knew that it's going to be something big and something special, but you know, you, you also have an element of walking in faith. The report I'm giving you today, again, I, I, I don't want to put any person on a pedestal, but, but God is using uh, El Shaddai in such a way in this work here, you, you, you need to continue to really be in real strong support and also significant prayer for Pastor Belt. And we came here today as a family. We drove all the way from Idaho, from Spokane, to come this, 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 uh, don't feel bad for us. We did some hiking, some kayaking. We, <laughs> You know, highway number two is pretty awesome, you know. But uh, we really came here for that because I feel that there's something, you know, we talk about, especially now, Ben this this tough time. But in the midst of all of this, there is great news. 
there's really, really good news. And, and today I want to give you some good news. Uh, as I was listening to the uh, portion and what Pastor Belts was speaking about, and I asked the question, again, and it's a question all of you need to ask today, is why is it that uh, Bil'am says, Matovu alecha Yaakov mishkenotecha Israel? There's a quantity here in the text, and I think there's a secret for the blessing that is being poured not just upon El Shaddai, but upon all who are understanding this time. Because he's saying, Matovu alecha Yaakov, Jacob, your dwelling place, Israel. The rabbi asked the question, why is he saying Jacob? And then he says Israel. Do you know that the tabernacle, the tabernacle also has two names. The tabernacle is called the tent, and it's also called the mishkan. One is in a very low state, and one is in a very, very high state. The idea here is, is when Israel is called Jacob, they are not in their fullness yet. But to every time that you see the name Israel mentioned, Israel is walking on his fullness. And we see something shocking here in this portion because it says that the Holy Spirit parted upon a wicked man. And you ask the question, this guy is crazy. How can the Holy Spirit be upon this man? It is because for one second, I believe, he had a vision of the fullness of Israel. Friends, you understand that God is not done with the Jewish people. He's not done with Israel. And although today Israel is yet to accept Yeshua corporately, God is not done. And there will be a day that Israel, we will walk as a nation with our fullness. And anybody in the room, anybody who's watching online right now, who have the vision for the, as Paul says, to the city to come, for the things to come, the Holy Spirit will depart upon them in the last days. And that's why God is blessing. The work is here. In order to get to this, and, and, and I hope everybody's seen this, there's a conflict. I want to read to you something I wrote in Rivka Remnant, and I'm going to get this very special presentation. Listen carefully to this. Because Pastor Belt uh, went with us, and he just didn't understand. He thought, well, Rabbi Shapira, uh, I'm going to come and speak twice. And I said, no, Pastor Mark, God have a much bigger plan for this visit. Are you ready to visit the vice president? Are you ready to visit the Congress? Are you ready to pray over, let's say, the equivalent, don't boo me, but the equivalent of the Nancy Pelosi <laughs> of the car? Are, are, are we ready to transform a nation? Amen. This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to transform nations. So I say, get ready, come ready, come prepared. And text God, he came prepared because I want you to understand every time, everything from this point forward is going to be involve a spiritual war, a spiritual warfare. Not by might, not by power, but by the Ruach, says the Lord of armies. We are in a spiritual battle now, right now. Listen to this. I find it to be very appropriate. It's a, I wrote in the Rivka Remnant, roughly 2,000 years ago, a great force birthed Christianity into the world to face with Judaism in an epic battle that would lead to the coming of the Messiah. At the exact moment, we enter the days of Messiah. Although we can look at the relationship between the two over the last 2,000 years as a label for the word chaos, we must conclude that even the struggle inside Rivka room in the birthing that took place 2,000 years ago between Esau and Jacob, this struggle will prepare the world to redemption. There is something that is happening right now, even inside the church. Now, we walked into an environment that is very different from the environment in the United States. Here in the United States, there is a separation between the church and the state. But in the islands, in the Caribbean, the church running the country. The pastor is like the vice president, and the vice president running the largest let's say TV station and the largest radio station. And how amazing it is that we can use those things to glorify God. But I want you to be wise for a moment. Do you realize the scripture that says that Satan masquerade is an angel of light? I mean, so, so, so look what the enemy is doing right now. We have, and I'm going to use the term loosely, we have a 
uh, uprising in a positive way of awakening of the Gentiles to what I call messianicism, to understanding the messianic walk, the Jewish roots of the faith. Okay, and to really waking up. So since 2015, we've been war going to the island. The first time that they find out that there's a Jewish person that believe in Yeshua, they were very excited. They wanted to meet me. And they asked me, are you a Christian? I said, no, I'm not a Christian. I'm a Messianic Jew. He said, oh my gosh, you're a Messianic Jew. I don't want anything to do with you. And, and I said, why? Well, what's the matter? Why don't you want anything to do with us? I said, well, we have a problem. We have a lot of Messianic Jews here in this, in this, in this island. And, and I said, okay, what are they telling you? They're telling us. So, so they say, they're telling us, number one, we must circumcise ourselves. Number two, they tell us that there is no such a thing as a virgin birth. Number three, they tell us that there is no such a thing as a divine Messiah. And number four, they told us that we have to re just reject everything we learn in Christianity and just become really antagonistic toward the church. And those people are infiltrating the church, and now they're bringing people out of the, even the Messiah, out of believing in Messiah, as we know it. You see what the enemy is doing? Yeah. He's taking something that there is maybe a grain of yeah. truth, yeah. and then it's it, it just using it to cause a chaos and division. So in the last six years, seven years, we've been working on repairing this bridge, and it's a battle. David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, said it like this. In order to have peace, we have to go to war. We had to go to war for seven years to get to a point that the church now understand, brothers and sisters, why walking in the Jewish roots of the faith. And I'm not talking about a church. I am talking about a nation. We are talking about a national revival. Friends, we need to start to believe for a national revival. So I said to myself, I'm going to need the firepower to come with me for this one. So I, I, I already had a hint for what's going on. I'm just giving you a quick segue to what you're about to see. So I said, would it be possible for Pastor Bill to come? I'm a Jew. Although you have Jewish blood, I told you, no, no, you're going to be a pastor for this trip. <laughs> But as he told you, the problem is the pastor turned to the Jewish rabbi and the rabbi turned to the pastor. It was totally confusing probably for the people. No, it wasn't. It was amazing. And they were able to experience the power of the gospel. And what is the power of the gospel? Let me ask you a question. Why was the second temple being destroyed? Baseless? What will build the third temple? Baseless love. love. The power of establishing the, or preparing for the third, third Beta Mikdash is love. It's not theology. It's not theology. It is our relationship. It's relationship, relationship, relationship. And I can tell you, we met with the top people in the nations. And you know who was impacted the most? Not just the church. Our Jewish people our Jewish people. Let's go to the first slide, beloved. I want to testify on this today so you understand what God is doing right now. Here's a picture of me and Pastor Belt. That's a beautiful picture. And guess what? This is an historic moment. The Israeli embassy just launched their very, very new building. And guess who they invited there to this place to meet with the ambassador of Israel? Put, put up the picture one more time. This is on top of the building. Pastor Bell, myself, getting ready to meet the ambassador of Israel. Amen. This is exciting, friends. Amen. And by the way, I must say, Yeshua is not compromised in any way. They even allow us to pray in the name of Yeshua over the ambassador. Hallelujah. It was an amazing, it was like having a red carpet. They said it's going to be 20 minutes meeting. It was an hour and a half. Wow. The embassy even provided us a nice little kosher sandwiches. <laughs> and the powerful thing about this is we have emissaries from the entire Latin world are coming. As you know, in 2013, God has given me a vision for Yeshiva Shuvu. El Shaddai was the very first and by far the largest ministry that supported this vision. Amen. 
And look what God is birthing now, 10 years ago. Who would have imagined that we would have gotten to this moment, to this time, that we will be able to walk into the Israeli embassy and pray and pray for the nation and pray for the movement of the embassy to Jerusalem. This is the move of God, friends. Amen. Go to the next picture, if you don't mind, Jill. Check this out. This is emissaries here from all over. Those are, those are students of our yeshiva. And I got to tell you, they were so touched. I didn't know how they're going to have the, the dynamic with Pastor Belts. Uh, they're watching. The, I talked to them yesterday, to all of them. They were so touched. That you came. The guy, for example, in the far left, far right in that picture, he is a surgeon, Dr. Avram Contreras, the only true authentic messianic congregation in El Salvador. We have the brothers from Colombia, from the Dominican Republic, from Chile, where we see the greatest uprise in extreme Islam right now. Do you realize it's Santiago? So anti Semitic, so dangerous. And here in the middle of this, there's a beacon of light. Thank Look at this. Amen. We have the brothers here from uh, Tom Flores from Orlando. You see this guy in the, black, uh, in the black jacket to the far left? This is the bishop who is responsible for all of church of God on the island. He oversees 1,300 churches, 1,300 churches, and he came because he wanted to meet and be in this, and look at the mere first row, who is the guy in the middle? This is the ambassador of Israel, beloved, this is the ambassador of Israel, he's standing, look at the love that we have, so we have the Colombian, and look at the back there, our Portuguese and Brazilian brothers showed up. Those are all ministry leaders who came for this moment. Friends, we are seeing this is the gospel. Amen. This is the gospel, friends. Check out the next photo, friends. This is a picture with the guy in the far left. This is the ambassador of Israel. And one of the powerful moments is, is when Pastor Bell, we, we pray over the ambassador. The ambassador allows the prayer pray with us. I wish I could show you all the videos. I know we are limited time, but Pastor Belt was speaking about the Amidah. So the Lord starts steering my heart, saying, let's do this. We invited all the Jews into the, into the stage. There were a bunch of Jewish people, some Messianic, some non-Messianic Jews, and we invited the entire crowd. They all stood and they did a standing prayer together, and we pray upon the ambassador publicly. This is the fullness of the Gentiles. Amen. This is what the end goal for you, to pray together through the power of Messiah upon your Jewish brothers. What an amazing moment it is. And it's been all over the press. Check out the next picture. This one blessed my heart so much. This is uh, Pastor Belts with the ambassador. And the ambassador of Israel came and he says, I am so touched. You need to pray. Because in 1938, beloved, something supernatural happened. All the nation rejected Jews. Some Jews knew already something terrible going to happen in, in Europe. So they came and the nation of Dominican Republic and Guatemala, the two only nations who took Jews. And they created a village, a Jewish village in a city called Sosua. And guess what? They have the historic synagogue standing there today. We are supporting a project now together with the Jewish community to restore this synagogue, full restoration. And we reach out to the ambassador and we ask the ambassador, ambassador, will you allow us in 2023 to use it for Shabbat morning service? We need to pray because the ambassador said absolutely yes. Yes, yes, keep on praying. This is, and they know we are messianic. There is no question about it. Yeshua is being proclaimed. Friends, we are experienced truly this, taking the Torah not just to the nation, but even to the Jewish people. Look at what God is doing. Those are our Jewish people. One of my brothers was there. He's not a believer. His name is Eliyahu. He's a former major league baseball player. He wrote me, he said, this Shabbat was the single most impactful Shabbat I've probably ever experienced. 
This is a good testimony. This is a good report. But wait, let's continue. Go to the next one. What about the nations? Go to the next. Oh, here, Pastor Belson. Sometimes you have to speak with his mask, sometimes without his mask. It was pretty interesting. But it was interesting. We're getting up at 7.30 every morning. By 9 o'clock, we're already running all the way to 11 p.m. And I said, oh, my goodness, this is not Seattle. How Tacoma, how Pastor Matt's going to handle it in this heat? It's like 90 degrees. We're always with suit and ties. He's always speaking somewhere. And at the end of the day, I could tell Pastor Belt, God, give him grace. Give him grace. And he gave him grace. He gave him grace to continue to teach and go on and on and on. Praise be to God. Go to the next slide. Now, I wanted to pay attention to something amazing here. Do you notice this little cell phone? It's have a tweet. I don't know how many of you can read the tweet. The tweet comes from Israel Republic Dominican, from the government of Israel. The government of Israel tweeted about this event, and they blasted it all over the world. Beloved, not us. This is not our press release. This is the state of Israel blasted twice. And they said, we are so blessed by the group of Christians and Messianics who are coming together and not fighting with one another. And they're coming to bless us. Wow, we want to everybody to know about it. And let me tell you something. Chabad tried to stop it. It's the truth. They tried to stop it. But there was so much unity, so much love that, that the ambassador, that I couldn't believe that they tweeted it, friends. This is a good news. This is a good report. Amen. This is the very first one that we ever had. And we're going to have many, many more. Praise be to God. We are watching history, beloved. Amen. This is historic. Continue. Go to the next slide. What about affecting governments? What about affecting governments? I want you to pay attention. You're about to watch in, in, in a few minutes a 60-second movie. Watch it carefully. But let me share with you what happened. They have a Congress. They have the House of Representatives. They have like a Senate, a House of Representatives, and the Office of the President. We had a chance to minister in all three places in what's called also the palace. Make it as you can go to the next picture, actually. This picture is right there with all the delegates as we are about to enter into the Congress. This is like entering into the Congress. You know, if you wonder why everybody dressed formal, because we are about to meet the legislators of the country. And all what they want us to do is to pray for them. We need to pray that this will happen in America. Amen, amen. And this was an amazing moment. Go to the next slide. Check this out. This is in the entry to the White House, beloved. Hallelujah. This is, they call it the palace. They don't call it the White House. But in all practical reason, that's what it is. Hallelujah. And the advisor for the president, the, the advisor to the president, by the way, he is the minister of religion. He is the second most powerful man probably in the country. The advisor for the president is the minister of religion over all of it. He is not just, he is walking us. You see the guy with the blue suit? His name is Dio Estasius. He is walking us through the palace personally to show us all of those things. What amazing testimony it is. Check this out. Go to the next slide. This is the Nancy Pelosi of the Dominican Republic. <laughs> Say hello to him. He wanted us to pray for him. Pastor Bethlehem, hand, and I recall we blew the shofar there. We blew the shofar, we lay hand, and we pray. Amen. You're going to see the video released by the government. I couldn't believe they released the video the same day. What a powerful testimony this is. Go to the next one. Next one, here we go. This is the House of Representatives. You see, this is where they ballot. That's where they vote, yay or nay. And they had a terrible thing because they have like, a, let's say, 100 seats. They have two or three people pro-life. 
I mean pro-choice, pro-choice. Everybody else is pro-life. And they were so panicking to have like two or three people that they want us to come and to pray specifically Praise for God. that. Amen. Yeah. And actually, we are here in, inside this house of representatives after this fabulous, fabulous event. Go to the next one. This is one of the most powerful pictures probably of the trip. Do you see this man? This man is potentially going, potentially, I'm not saying there's a, he's either going to be the next president or he's going to be the next mayor of Santo Domingo. He's the second person of the nation. That's the minister of religion. We are inside his office. This is his own office. You see Pastor Bell's lay hand and he's praying for him. He asked for prayer. He said, will you pray for us? We pray. We talked about Jerusalem. We're talking about the messianic faith. We talk about all of those things, like a man speaking to a man. Friends, this is the fullness of the Gentiles. This is the messianic revival that we've been waiting for. And it's not just affecting some church. It's affecting, affecting the government. Praise be to God. Look at God. What is it? I, we did not know that 10 years ago that this will happen when I, we started the, the, the ministry, when Pastor Ma, And all of it is based on one thing, relationship. Amen. Relationship. All of this praise be to God. Next slide, next picture. Before we look at the churches, I want you to see what the government, not me, not Pastor Belt, they released it to every church on the island, every government official, they released this. You will see the logo. Uh, Jill, can you show the 60 second video and maybe turn the audio so they can hear it? Check this out. I don't know if they can hear the audio. They probably cannot. It's ever beautiful. This is our, where we meet all the, la this is all house members. This is all a house member, friends. This is all government officials. And here uh, we are. And this is people who are in, in the house, they have a voting right, and we are there to pray for them. This is like ended up for a prayer. This is the ambassador of Israel. This is the house member. This is all the people who run the nation. You see the flag of Israel there. This is the house member, and he asked us to pray, pray for him. He gave a few words, and they wanted the chauffeur to be blasted inside inside their their homes. This was what a powerful moment and you see the ambassador of Israel right next to next to him we'll check it out for a second I'm sorry the, the, there's no audio but you see here we are actually Pastor Belt and I we are laying hand we are praying for the government beloved this is a powerful prophetic moment this man is running for president we met a, we met actually three presidential candidates one of them is going to probably win. And guess what? All of them want to line themselves from Jer with Jerusalem. Praise, God. Praise, God. Praise be to God. What about the church? Is the church all that bad? Well, there's going to be a remnant from the church. Praise be to God. Let me show you a couple of quick pictures. Check this out. This is, a, this is a church, an outdoor church, actually. Pastor Belts had the chance to teach in a, under the skies in an outdoor church. It was pouring rain, and we said, rain, let it stop. It stopped right in time when they do an event to honor Israel, where they changed the name of the main street to Jerusalem Street. They name, renamed legally the name of the street, Jerusalem Street. It's like your 405. It's equivalent to your 405. They change it illegally to Jerusalem Street. Isn't that amazing? Ooh. Praise be to God. To your next, next picture. This is one of the most powerful, powerful moments. Everybody know the most powerful moments take place in Starbucks, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, actually, I want to tell you something. Um, we had a big, big disappointment. And you need to understand that the forces... The forces that are working right now. The man to the left that you see here, he is the, uh, he's the bishop. Church of God is the largest denomination. We were supposed to sign an agreement of bringing a portion of our school into the entire system of the Church of God, anti-Caribbean. 
I mean, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of, hundreds of scholarships that we were ready to donate. It. There were some forces that came against it during the pandemic, and they stopped. They stopped. It was the enemy. It was literally the enemy trying to stop them from leaving Egypt. It's, I cannot explain it to you. When he met Pastor Bills and I, the bishop said, listen, I came here because I really need to tell you something important. He says to me, I cannot say everything you tell us, but he says to me, basically, I made a mistake. Praise God. It was a mistake. I come to repent. That's a man of God. Over a cup of coffee, anything can happen. <laughs> he said, I made a mistake. I repent. I'm leaving the office in August. My last act as the bishop over the church of God is to make sure that this is launched in the island. And that's introduced to the entire, not just island, to all of the Caribbeans. So in, the, in, in just a blink of an eye, the, the Holy Spirit touched one man who is the, the decision maker and, and, and Pastor Belt's here. We are praying for him. It was an amazing to see the power of the living God. You know, we're, we're talking about Torah. I have power. Hallelujah. It's not just head knowledge. Torah has the supernatural element. You have a speaking donkey. There is a supernatural things that happening here. We experienced something supernatural. I've been laboring for this moment for seven years. For, if you want to understand, to this moment in the Starbucks, seven years going back and forth, back and forth. And when did it happen? Mark, I hope you're not going to offend when I say it. But when a Jew and a Gentile came together, the power of God is working in a supernatural way. Beloved, this is not belonging to Avatami ministry. The glory go to God. And El Shaddai have a big part of all of this, and I want you to experience and understand this. Go to the next one. This is uh, in the big event. Pastor Belts gave a teaching, and actually, we're going to do something to bless all of you. We actually, all of this event has been captured, captured in high quality. Those of you who subscribe to El Shaddai, because what I'm telling you, you need to experience. All of those messages are going to be loaded to El Shaddai uh, YouTube channel. You need to watch it and see what the Lord is doing. Pastor Belt gave a teaching on replacement theology. And, and I can tell you, he knocked it out of the ballpark in this teaching to the point that they said, when are you coming back again? It was such a powerful, powerful move of God in those two teachings. So make sure... Uh, that you catch those teachings. They are profound and they're in English and Spanish in parallel. Go to the next slide. This is another pastor, one of the most influential pastors in the island that he, he is there. He's just been touched. He's been moved by God very much. Check out this next picture. I love that one. This is also now we are established our own coffee house our own coffee as our students. As a, so we are using it. This is not exactly messianic and it's not exactly a church. It's quite a lot like El Shaddai in many ways. We are a bridge there between the church and between, between Judaism. And uh, Pastor Manny Valera, he won the highest award, the Emmy. He's an Emmy, like a... Uh, uh, award for trumpeting and orchestra and he is there on the ground he's doing the work and he just loved love love <laughs> having pastor mark there's so much so this a lot of this is the students and the one of the things that was extremely powerful is pastor belt uh, had the chance to do a uh, mini yeshiva for our students and to talk about end times and that's also going to be loaded into your channel what a powerful, powerful uh, uh, a way to connect and, and, and to see how God is, is. They can't wait for the next time already. So we're going to try to do it uh, once a year, just bigger and better. Check out the next one. What about popular culture? Can we use popular culture to glorify God? And the answer is, of course. TV, radio, check this next one. I like this picture. This is, how many of you know this show? What is it called? The ABC, the Today Show? 
Today Show, is that what it's called? Yeah. This is their version of the Today Show. Pastor Belts and I were invited to the Today Show. And who is the number one viewer of the Today Show? The president of the country. He loved this show. It's the most popular show. They're not, it's not a religious show per se. It's a show that it, they just wanted to see a, a Jewish rabbi and a Christian pastor on the stage. And that was a powerful thing for them. Friends, this is all of them. So they brought all of them with the flex. Check out the next one. It's, it's, it's absolutely go to the next one. This is Pastor Mel, Belts in the radio station. <laughs> and you see they have the antiques because it's the oldest radio station. And he was there with the, car, with the minister of religion who happened to be the owner of the radio station. You see how it works out? How all things work, even resources you need. God provided all the resources for those things. And they wanted to do an interview, English and Spanish with us. That was so much fun. Check out the next one. This is Pastor Belt on TV. This is actually a photo somebody took on TV. This is the most viewed show on, on the entire island. And here we are talking about, about I think I stole the, your time on that one, you know, oh, yes. Good. But, it's, but, you know, it was just amazing. Check out the next one. This is Pastor Belts teaching the students. Also, those are all ministers. They're all messianic teachers. And he's teaching. That was a very powerful moment for me to experience that. That's one of my favorite uh, pictures, the next one. So here we are. We are on TV, and they wanted to see everybody, every nation. This is the Torah to the nation. This is Yeshua to the nation. This is what God is doing, beloved. And believe that this impact is now on another level. It's on a national level, continental level, international. The one of the biggest success, look at this picture. Uh, Pastor Belts had a chance uh, to teach in the largest church on the island. Yeah, it was actually, they said 3,800, but hey, you know, it was between 3,500 to 4,000 people showed up to this event. Friends, you need to listen to those teachings. They are going to become available for all of you. This is what the Lord is doing in those days. He is raising the remnant. Amen, amen. And we need to believe in this. It's not a racial thing. It is not a, a, even a geographical thing. It's a God thing. Amen. It is a God thing. I think that's the last one. Do I have one more? Oh, and look at the result. Just before Shabbat, just before Shabbat, we got the paperwork from the government. So think about they have in America what's called the Christian coalition, right? Because of what they happened, and they understand now we are Messianic Jews when they accept us as brothers in the faith. The government came and said, you need to have a voice in this coalition that's going to run the religious affairs in the country. And they have given us, you see, not pastor, actually as Rabino, after what they have experienced, that's not, they said, it's not going to harm us. It's not going to teach us something crazy. They said that Messianic Judaism need to have a voice. And this is an amazing moment. Because any changes, we're talking about the bridges of the wall tomorrow, 17 of Tammuz. Anything, anything that is have to be built, as Nehemiah did, you build from the inside, not from the outside. You need to be an inside in order to repair something. Remember that. So why is this so significant? Look what God has done. Something that took seven years to do has been accomplished in two weeks. This event was so impactful that the church has given now the green light to launch the full school, full Torah school. That's what we're doing there. We're building the, the school. We're launching the school. So we met with the government and we awarded them $209,000 worth of scholarship money. Guess how many of those scholarship has been taken? 100%. 100%. I am leaving here El Shaddai 
I'm going two days just to recover mentally, and I'm in the next flight to the Dominican Republic. This next Friday, I need you to pray. Between Amitzarim and those days, look what's happened. The official kickoff, 137 pastors starting their journey back to Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And it's sealed by the government. The government. Don't tell me all the governments are bad. Some governments are good. So today, we give you just a taste of what it is because I want you today to believe that we are in the time. We are in a good time of the remnant. And God is calling you to be. And he always the remnant is one who will influence. He's become an influencer. And El Shaddai is an influencing community. And Pastor Belt is an influencing kind of guy. That's why they're asking me already, when are you coming back? When he's coming back? I guess I'll have to talk to him, you know? Yeah. Maybe I'll bribe him in a few days in the, some recovery after that. He's running like 90 degrees humility and, uh, you know, it's tough. But because of all of that, and, and we prayed as a family, we really, really want to honor today Pastor Belts. Yeah. We really want to honor you. And what I mean honoring you is honoring your pastor, honoring your teacher. So we decided something as, a, as an organization today and also to pray the, the world need El Shaddai right now, stronger than ever, stronger than ever in these last days. And we need to pray for, first of all, for strength for Pastor Belts. Because events like that are needed. Are needed in Africa. Are needed in two and a half weeks in Korea. I will be. They needed in Korea. They needed in Europe. They needed all over the world because there's a call to the remnant. So we wanted to do today something. Um, it's not a birthday gift. I believe it's something you earn, Pastor Belt. So um, we want to do something today that. I think is, is due. As you know, we are running our school, our yeshiva, with over 1,200 students. And it's really difficult to get any type of certification, uh, especially now we are governmental, multinational. We are certified in 132 countries. And uh, it's hard. That's Sherry. She had a hard time in my exam last week, right? Yeah. She know She know that. But we want to honor you today. Pastor Mark Betts, will you come up? Will you give a lot of hand? And, and uh, Sherry, do you, do you have the first, the, the first thing? The, the, Tom, the Tom Torrance Yeah, yeah. No, the other thing. The other, the we, as an organization, feel we have to honor those who are coming and doing this kind of work. So what we decided to award, in 10 years of doing it, I awarded it only once. This is the only second time I did it. But today we want to, um, as an organization, we want to honor you, Pastor Mark, with a certificate of honor, honorary ordination from our international organization as a Torah teacher, as a Moret Torah that is recognized by the community. And I like to, before I give it to you, I like to read it to you. And he says, and he said to his lad, run, find the arrow, which I am. It's also saying Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make people of all nations into Talmudim. It's also say in the ethics of the father, they say three things. Be deliberate in judgment, raise up many Talmudim and make a friends for the Torah. This certificate today is presented to you. Moret Torah Mark Mat Matthew Belts on July 16, 2022. This is an acknowledgement from our entire organization of uh, asmicha, ordination, recognized by Yeshivat Shuvu that Israel and the world lean upon to be recipient as a Torah teacher in structure of the scriptures and also in Messianic Judaism. Friends, let's stand up and pray for Pastor Belt. <laughs> Hallelujah. We bless the Lord for you. Lord, thank you that 
Pastor Belt heard the calling from the Lord. He heard the calling. And today we stand as believers, both Jewish believers and non-Jewish believers. We stand today and we affirm, we affirm and stand firmly on this calling. And we said, Lord, you have equipped this man for this time. You equip him for this season. And we came here, Lord, to say today, Pastor Belts have life in greater abundance. I speak life upon him. I speak life upon his family. I speak life upon his children. I speak life upon El Shaddai. I say life. Everything he touch will have Chaim. The ministry will thrive. Well, ministry have yet to reach the top. There is additional wave of growth in this last day that is coming upon El Shaddai, Lord. And today, Lord, we just affirm it. We affirm it, Abba, that you have equipped him to be not just the studier of the word, but the interpreter, the interpreter of the word. Abba, we stand today, the community, your community, not come forward right now, just extend your hands, extend your hand. We want specifically to pray this ironic benediction upon the community and upon especially the Belts family. Please extend hands as Noah, please do this ironic benediction upon him and upon his family. Thank you, Lord, that you are using him. And we say for the doubt of our Satan, not to touch him, not to touch him in any way, shape, or form. Go ahead, Noah, extend your hand. It's dead. It's dead? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Can <laughs> Can you hear it? Can Pastor Beltran, be shalom upon your work, upon your doing, upon your ministry, upon your marriage, upon your relationship. And may you bring the message of Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, upon all, all who come in contact with you, Jew and Gentile alike. We say shalom, 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 shalom. upon you. Amen and amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Noah. And Thank you. wait, we have one more thing. We have one more thing. We Jews love tradition, and we have a traditional gift for you. I want you to open it in real time, if possible, so everybody see this. This is a gift to go with your ordination. So you can try to start with this and open this and see what this is. So you know, every Torah teacher need a good stand. So we ended up carving one for you. Wow. And it is go like that. What do you yeah. do? You see what you're saying? You say you put it, you put it oh, that way around, actually. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. And I want you to notice something, Pastor Belt. We put the verse from uh, the book of Joshua here, yet the cup of the, the book of the Torah will not will on your the book of the Torah on your lips will be on your hand, meditate on that day and night, yeah. and so forth and so forth. And here in the back, what we did, we put actually your name, so nobody can use it except you. It says, <laughs> Mark Belt Moret Torah Kehilat El Shaddai, in order of taking to Torah to the nation. Hallelujah. And to go with this is the beautiful Shema. Oh, wow. Uh, so praise be to God. Let's give the Lord a hand. And we want to tell you that you are partners in those type of report. Keep on pushing. 
and honoring your teachers. Honor them. Don't give him too much hard time. <laughs> Take the burden because we need him strong. We have a lot of work to do all over the world. Shabbat shalom, everybody, Pastor Bill. Before you go, tell everybody about tomorrow. Okay. Praise be to God. Tomorrow, tomorrow, you don't want to miss. We have prepared something that I've never done publicly. I am going to be teaching you in the morning to the book of Haggai. We are going to look, it's a, it's a rare book, the book of Haggai. We're going to look at the connection of the message of 17 of Tammuz to the book of Haggai. We are not going to have a chance to go through the entire book. We are just going to cover chapter one of the book of Haggai because it's a, a message for us for the next three weeks. So come ready, come prepared. Also, if some of you want to get the Rivka remnant and stuff like that, I'll have some of my resources, not a lot left, but those who come early can get it. There will be uh, study notes. It's going to be amazing, amazing opportunity for you to be here. We also live stream. We're going to start at 9 a.m. sharp. So we can't wait to teach you a message and a call to the remnant from the book of Haggai. Looking forward to it. Praise be to God, Pastor Belt. Let's give the Lord a hand for you. We'll see you tomorrow. Shabbat shalom.